You in? You in? You in? How about now? I just keep going off the screen. <laughs> How are you? Welcome to the Backpack Show, Carrie O'Shea Gorgon. So good. Mm -hmm. How are you? Best day of my life. I'm frolicky. <laughs> these, are, these are the high stakes issues people come here for. <laughs> Big interesting things. Um, hey, we have Dr. Mike Rucker, uh, author of The Fun Habit. Yes, we're going to talk about the book, The Fun Habit, and how incorporating fun into your life is really good for your health and how to do it. We clearly don't have fun. We, we don't have enough fun. We can ah, never have we enough have fun. fun. Yeah. There can be only fun. Hi, everyone. Tim Kitzer from NBA Jam and NFL Blitz, welcoming you to The Backpack Show. Your hosts, Chris Brogan, Kerry Gargone, Boom Shakalaka. Backpack Show. I never sing the song backstage while we're doing this i don't i usually pick somebody to look at but the light in here is like really bright on that side now so <laughs> now i'm just like you know what we need is like a towel or something over that window or shoot. shut up i look for uh for jesse cole in that case like if that's oh. with him because it's like bright yellow so usually i can like make it out even from over here mike would like jesse cole too he was just telling me he watched a few episodes. He watched the Johnny Cupcakes episode. I'm Christian. not talking to you. Hey, we're sponsored by StreamYard. Want some ducks? Go to StreamYard. <laughs> they give you free ducks with every purchase. Uh, Cbrogan.net slash StreamYard. It is the easiest thing to use. Even when I had a technical problem, it worked. Super easy. Uh, Mike was, everything was fine. It was actually my tr trouble on my Mac, but like every single configuration I would try, it would work. And I, it was just like, I still couldn't hear <laughs> It worked off of the connection to my phone. You know how you can like link up with your phone oh, when there's yeah. no internet? You it made worked. it run off your phone? Yeah. What? Okay. Um, hey, want a dot online domain? You can get one. Who wouldn't want one? You can go to cbrogan.net slash online. Use the code Chris any way you want to type it, really. You have to do it all caps or it will, you won't get the discount. This way you get a dot online domain for 99 cents. 99 cents? Mm -hmm. for, for a year. For a year. For a year. And then F you. That, it's not that much thing. after that. I don't even know. I have so many dumb ones. I have like dot ETH. Yeah, oh, that's right. Dot whatever the other one was. Everybody thought would be something. <sighs> <laughs> I don't remember. Let's get the good doctor right here. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Mike Rucker. How are you? Hello, Chris and Carrie. Thanks for having me. <laughs> this is very early in the relationship for you to sound like that. <laughs> <laughs> he sounds like he's already tired of our book. <laughs> A little bit. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my mom is in the audience, so you have Yay. to be very kind. My biological father, Steve Rogan, is. Uh, They're his parents, in other words. Yeah. Chloe is here. Steve Garfield from stevegarfield.com. The first video blogger. Yeah. Back when you had a hard code. So famous. Into your website. Hi, Leslie. I was telling you about Leslie. Um, and then there we go. And then we nailed the mic situation because Carrie brought her fancy ass mic over. So we have a fancy ass mic. I got a tip on this. For Bureau from Jexo. Now yeah. AppFire Bureau put me onto Appfire. this. So Monday coffee with AppFire. I'm heading Put me on to this buttons. mic. I was going to do one more thing, Dr. Mike, and then <laughs> we'd, we, everything would be better. Which thing? I was okay. going to do this. Um, oh, cool. Did, oh, it, thank did you. it work? I can't even see a thing. Hey, look, the fun habit. Um, all right. So, this is the kind of book that sometimes people read, and this is the kind of book that sometimes people <laughs> think they're going to read and they never do. What's going to tip them over to make them read this book? Oh, yeah, that's a. No way. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Bureau. No, it's fine. I think this is <laughs> this is fun, especially since you get to see him. Usually, I'm in the dark because I don't get to see it on my screen. No, I think that's right. You know, sometimes a lot of these books are sort of resonate with the anointed. You know, certainly like folks that are in the quote unquote play culture, um, I think have found that. You know, my main argument is essentially this concept of time affluence, and especially for what you know, um, the, the topics of your show with regards to, you know, sort of interesting slants at looking at success in business. This idea that um, similar to in the 90s when we were talking about sleep deprivation and kind of not getting sleep and being more productive. And then really quickly, we found out, you know, how asinine that assertion was. We're finding the same things out with fun and leisure. And we're finding that the folks that are the most successful are actually the ones that are taking some time off the table for themselves. And so I found that really interesting as a construct. So there are two things in the book. There's one, you know, how do you look at fun and leisure in a way um, as a tool for productivity, right? And then the other, which is, is kind of different, but it's important in the context, especially here in the US, is how prescribed we've been to toxic, uh, toxic positivity. 
um, and that wow. you find that these folks that are chasing happiness paradoxically are are becoming unhappy. And so I kind of I'm not laughing both. at you. I'm laughing at she's laughing one. at me because sometimes I'm toxic. <laughs> Um, time affluence. Uh, let's do a definition for the kids at home. Yeah. So it's essentially the amount of autonomy you have over your schedule, right? Um, you know, my background as an academic was looking at, uh, you know, this concept of social determination theory. And it's not important to know that. What's important to know is that in that field, we were looking at autonomy and its effect on both psychological and physiological health. And we know that folks that don't have a lot of choice and way to sort of organize their time within their vocation tend to have really poor um, outcomes and people that are able to, you know, that are still just as productive, but feel they have agency and autonomy about how they go about their day um, tend to thrive and also have better results. Um, not just on the productivity side, but also on the innovation side, they tend to be more creative because they look for challenges rather than look at their to-do list and you know, kind of attack it in a linear fashion, like, let me just get through this day. And so there's the, the psychological, you know, the kind of geek word for it is called the hedonic flexibility principle. But, um, you know, the short answer kind of layman terms is that people that work really hard tend to not have a lot of vitality to do anything afterwards. And so it becomes this downward spiral, right? You, you start to engage in uh, what we call passive leisure uh, forms of escapism that don't really lead to betterment, you know, things like, you know, just kind of. Oh, wait up, wait up, wait up, wait up, wait up, wait up. Okay. You, I have a couple I, things. Though. Yeah, go, go ahead. But I, we got to ask so, that one too. Go all right. Yeah. So is this just another way that people who are like less, um, have fewer opportunities get screwed <laughs> because they, they often do have to take jobs that they don't have a lot of autonomy over their, schedule they don't have a lot of yeah agency. i think and so if that's the case can they not then read your book and find ways to be happy or is it like no so you you're exactly right that there is you know i i have read the sort of criticism about life hacky books you know certainly a lot of the criticism that's been levied you know the tim ferris's of the world like okay well this is kind of dripping with privilege and i certainly think that to a degree um you know, there are going to be certain vocations that have more autonomy, but my academic background was working with physicians. And so even though that's a lucrative position, it certainly isn't tripping with privilege, right? These are folks that have very, you know, um, don't have a lot of time autonomy within their schedule. And so I think anyone can look at um, ways to figure out how can they reclaim some agency and autonomy over their time. So for example, you know, you there's only a few examples, but like single moms, how could you get creative by doing timeshare? You know, because a lot of times it's the domestic duties that really weigh you down. But if you share responsibilities, a lot of times when you can bundle things that I call quote unquote agonizing, you know, that shared load doesn't really increase the burden on, on that individual, especially because, you know, when kids are together, they can form groups and sort of self-manage. And so that frees the time. Like for toddler the gangs. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Um, well, because they're not being mischievous, right? They're, they're essentially engaging in play. And so this is one very micro example to just share that these strategies can be applied, but I certainly don't want to skirt that privilege isn't helpful, right? Because I think privilege is helpful in almost all domains, right? You had something, sorry. Well, so you, um, yeah, I'm going to forget the type. What, what's the term you used for like shitty leisure? Um, passive leisure. Passive leisure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you said. Uh, so the other one was the hedonistic something. Uh, the the yeah. hedonic flexibility. Hedonic principle. something. Say it one more time. Hedonic flexibility principle. That sounds like a '80s band. Um, so <laughs> it's it, that would be a good '80s band. <laughs> but, but so there's something there, and and I'm like I'm worried that your like academic self. We have to kind of we have to we have to get a little uh, more muddy. Uh, there's something there between those two things because what you're saying is there's there's ways that you can kind of squeeze a little bit of uh, juice out of the uh, orange, so to speak. Uh, but then there's another thing you're saying, which is that there are ways that you can think you're doing leisurely stuff, but it's. Uh, I always think of it as noble masturbation. Like junk food. Like a, yeah. yeah, junk food. Yeah. It feels it feels good, but it's not really doing much. Can well, and junk food's a perfect yeah, example. There... Yeah. No, yeah. I think junk, I, in the book, I call it, you know, in a colorful way, 
um, falling back on the never ending story, feeding the nothing, right? Essentially, we're trying to displace discomfort um, and we're not really doing anything that's enjoyable. It kind of tricks us to believe it is, right? Because, because we were in this sort of low level state of what, again, not to use geek words, but negative valence, right? We, we could call that boredom. We could call it discomfort. We could call it malaise. You know, different words are going to be meaningful to different people. But essentially, we just want to get out of that state. It's not fun, right, to, to use more pedestrian words. And so we try to um, alleviate that, that level of discomfort. And we do it in ways that when we look back at that time, we don't really have any recall, right? And so I feel like that's a good litmus test. Like if you look back and someone asks you, you know, a week from now, like how did you engage um, in that time? And you're like, oh, I don't, I couldn't even really tell you one thing that I saw because I'm certainly not trying to villainize um, media use. You know, some people do that, but I, I don't agree with that. I think if you're, you, like if you're a hobbyist and you're spending, you know, an hour really, you know, using those types of tools to get ideas so that you can go out and do the thing because it's uplifting, like then do that. That's fine. What I'm talking about is like doom scrolling, you know, again, junk food mm. could be a great thing. Uh, surf, you know, channel surfing and, but you, you're not really ever paying attention to a show. You're just trying to placate time. Um, and then there's other it's things with regards TikTok to for four hours. Yeah, exactly. Cause some of these things were built. Right. Um, and then the other side of that is um, those same tools, you know, the same, uh, behavioral scientists that are making TikTok addictive also made Slack and email addictive, right? And so especially for parents, you can, you think you're spending time with your kids, but essentially you're on your phone half the time and you're not being present because mm -hmm. those things give you that same, you know, my buddy Nir Eyal talks about this a lot, right? You see that little blinking LED on your phone and you can track like not just physiological or excuse me, not just psychological symptoms, but you have a physiological response you know, that kind of attracts you to that phone. So um, again, some of the strategies, right, are, are, are being aware that that happens and then creating bumper rails. So you really are protecting, you know, time outside of work to you enjoy yourself. Rails. I need bumper <laughs> rails. Um, I want to know some of the, I mean, not to, not to just poke at the title. No, no, please, please. How can we, how can we develop these habits? Like what are, how do you know you're doing the right kind of fun, Dr. Rucker? Yeah, I think that's only gonna, yeah. I mean, it's gonna be things that resonate with you, right? I think that's one of the challenges of writing a book like this. You know, we can define happiness in subjective terms and I kind of unpack why that has become problematic. You know, you know, you quantify happiness with something like subjective well-being, and now all of a sudden, you know, what happens when on your sort of artificial scale, you've hit a 10? Right. And but so many of us want to like grab onto a definition. And, you know, so I'll get, you know, because I, I love Gary Wolf and the whole quantified self movement. And so I'll be invited on those types of podcasts like, all right, so what are the, you know, what are the numeric measures? So I know if I'm having fun in my life, like, okay, we've already sort of missed the point. Right. So you're going to know what fun is for you. The problem is in the sandwich generation, right, which is loosely defined as folks 35 to 50 we just have more responsibilities than we ever have, right? Um, adults are having kids later and our, our parents are aging later. I'll be careful, Chris, because I know your parents are, are listening. But for well, they're a lot gonna of age us, later though. Yeah, they'll age oh, okay. later. Fair enough. Yeah. They put it on We're gonna schedule right that in. <laughs> okay. Um, so for a lot of us where in uh, you know, previous generations, our parents could help with you know, uh, childcare. Um, now we're taking care of our kids and our parents. And so um, there's this idea of the U-shaped curve of happiness. A lot of us are so overworked that we just don't have any reserve, any vigor or vitality to do anything for ourselves. And it's clear that this is leading to really poor outcomes. You're seeing record level of burnout in all vocations. Again, you know, my focus has been on physicians. This year, they've had the highest rate of burnout that they ever have, 63%. Of physicians, um, you know, indicating that they're burnt out. Anyone that plays on LinkedIn has seen stats trip out for this year. You know, um, and again, I could rattle off stats, but I meant it's clear from the data how bad um, we, you know, what kind of state we are in right now, and it needs a radical course corrective. And we're not talking about anything that's drastic, right? It's really just a lot of us aren't even enjoying three to four hours a week. You know, you look back 
do something like a simple time audit. And there's so many people that are like, oh my gosh, I can't even claim that I, you know, my 168 hours the previous week, I can't even look at one or two hours where I actually was doing something for myself. Well, what about the hours that you work if you're in something that people consider not fun? Like we're in B2B SaaS. <laughs> so some people might be like, wow, that's got to be super fun. But it actually is fun. Well, and because so of the people we work with and. Yeah. And I think there's an really argument fun. to be made that like, if you're not having fun, then there are ways to sort of bundle activities. Um, there's a lot of research to suggest taking breaks in the middle of it can be a great way to have fun. Um, but if you are having fun at work, great. You know, a lot like I've had some criticism of the book is like, uh, you know, I already this just validated them having a really fun life. Like, God bless. Right. Like, <laughs> great. Like, then you don't need the book. Like Chris said, you <laughs> jerk. I'm happy. Yeah. yeah. Why do you tell me why I suck? Yeah. And so um, because you're certainly not meant to have fun all the time, too. I unpack that in the book, but it's really oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> No, I think, you know, uh, there are going to be certain things, you know, I unpack the death of my brother in the book, there are going to be times where you do need emotional flexibility to deal with the downfall, because I had sort of over optimized my life for quote unquote happiness. And when I got knocked off my pedestal, because I didn't have that emotional flexibility, I was in a pretty dark place. I think people that are able to uh, endure the slings and arrows, and then also realize that funds around the corner when they unpack those emotions, are the ones that tend to be, you know, we call it good, you know, uh, mental health hygiene. Those are the ones that can really have the resilience to bounce back. When you don't have that resilience, you're so burnt out. You know, if one other thing kind of gets piled on, it can lead to clinical outcomes. And there's a lot of empirical evidence to support that claim. And what's the difference between building resilience and toxic positivity? Uh, those two are different, right? So toxic positivity is like the good vibes only shirt, right? Which essentially suggests that if you're in a state that isn't in line with that message, then somehow um, you should look at your self-worth or you're doing something wrong, right? And so clearly not, as I suggested before, not every day is meant to be full of good vibes, right? When my brother died, suggesting that I should, you know, you know get over it, someone loses their job or their livelihood to your point, right? Just saying, hey, you know, look at the bright side. Really? I, I'm supposed to do that today? <laughs> look you at know, all the so. new free time you have for passive yeah. leisure. <laughs> right, exactly. Especially when you're worried about taking care of your loved ones, right? And so that's toxic positivity when it create when the motivation of the message creates dissonance, where you're like, really, is that the ideal? And maybe, you know, you trust this person enough that you want to strive towards it, but it's not reachable. And so ultimately, it starts to affect your identity, like there must be something wrong with me. And so that becomes quite problematic. But I wonder if there's, so that's one, that's one, I was going to say use case, which makes it sound hmm. awful. Like your brother's death is a use hmm. case. That's not <laughs> the right way to say that. Sentence. Well, they're examples, they're, so that's fine. You know? Right. There you go. There's, that's one instance. Um, but on the other hand, so um, a long time ago, because uh, I'm very old, uh, but a long time ago, I took a course called the Psychological and Cultural Foundations of Play which is adjacent to fun, but, you know, one kind of likes to have fun if they play. At the same time, I was also taking a course where I was reading Night by Dr. Eli Wiesel and um, uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And in those, they were, for lack of any more scientific method here, it was a whistle while you work. You know, it was kind of like you can try to bring some joy to a shit spot. Um, is there some overlap in what you're talking about in fun habit? Is there some way that like, obviously the, the right time isn't like, Hey, my brother died. Well, you know, it would be fun, but is there something there for the other instances where you're in kind of some drudgery or sorrow? Yeah. So in the last chapter, I unpack, you know, folks that have really made big impacts. Right. And so I think the important message here, if you're looking at the macro view, is that the people that want to play the long game are the ones that take some time off the table for themselves. Because the ones that don't, even though they go into that, uh, you know, either cause or vocation with benevolent intent, end up ultimately slowly but surely wearing themselves out, which is such a shame because you have these folks that could make a tremendous impact, but because they didn't have some form of the ability to renew and recharge their batteries, they get burnt out, right? And it becomes insidious. It happens so slow, similar to sleep deficits, that you don't kind of realize it's happening. 
right? Especially if you're, you know, have the baggage of like, I am, you know, the, the quarterback of this issue. So I can't take time off. Okay. Well, in eight months, you're not going to be doing this and you're not going to be helping anybody. Right. And so I think that you kind of hit on, you know, the major sort of tenet of the book. And that is, if you want to do the hard stuff, then this becomes, you know, even if you don't want to do it for yourself, because you have this level of guilt, which oftentimes you do see a lot in domestic partnerships, um, you know, because they just feel like, hey, I, you know, right now I need to serve other people. Well, that's fine if that if that's your purview and your lens. But to serve those people as the best version of yourself, you still need to enjoy yourself a little bit. Um, and then I would unpack one other thing that I think is problematic in the West is we really celebrate extroverts, right? So another thing that I try to bring up in the book is the researchers that I, I give a, a tip of the hat to are Dr. Iris Mouse and, and Jeannie Sai out of Stanford. But this idea that a lot of low arousal activities, you know, like meditation, like reading a good book by the pool, you know, various uh, acts of self-care, those are still fun. Those are pleasurable. You know, fun's definition is just something that you find enjoyable and you're attracted to, right? But so many of us are like, okay, well, you know, what are you trying to do, Mike? You, you want me to go to a rock concert or some rave or Burning Man or whatever it is? Like, no, what we want you to do is, you know, if you you're going week after week and you're like, I'm just not enjoying anything. Um, let's figure out how to integrate some things that you are. Some people do find that at work. Like I had an interesting conversation with Noah Kagan from AppSumo, you know, where he was kind of challenging with some of those things in his twenties, his whole life was work with his friends. Like even when they were drinking, they were doing things like hackathons and whatnot. And that sort of, it, it helped uh, round some of the sharp edges that I had with my ideas, because I don't think that's wrong, right? If everything is invigorating and you're not showing up the next day depleted, then that's great. But I think for most people, especially as we get a little bit older, we're still going to need time for renewal. And again, the evidence um, backs me up on that, right? If you're just working till your head hits the pillow, especially what mm -hmm. we call busy work, things that aren't really moving you forward, so you don't feel good about the time that you spent. Um, you Listen, know, some of the separating my kids' underwear from the pants to put them in the <laughs> washing machine. That could be fun. <laughs> All right. Dean, Dean has one for us. He says, paraphrasing my father-in-law, we're too soft now. I fought in Korea when I was 20, and now yeah. we need ping pong tables at work. What's changed from his generation to now? Are we too soft now, or are we in denial uh, with regards to mental health? I think they didn't talk about mental health this my guess. Uh, or in denial then with regards to mm -hmm. mental health. Yeah, I read it wrong. So um, it was Dean's so dad. The case I make in the book is that, um, you know, for anyone that's read Daniel Pink's Drive, it really is the yeah. shift from algorithmic work to heuristic work. So the difference between um, our previous generation, my grandfather had, uh, you know, um, not a steel mill, but a foundry. Um, you know, most people knew when they were building widgets when the day was done right and so there was a clear transition ritual from work to leisure and also these companies were take, taking care of us so we kind of you know knew that there was sort of a package at the end of the day with heuristic work we don't know when our day ends and that's the big difference i will tell you that the ping pong table is insidious because that those measures you know the the, the sleep thing at, at the amazon office yeah. those are generally just to keep you at the office more so that's certainly the candy not, dispensary it, exactly Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even so it's the like work, amenities labor and with... play. Like that essay work, labor and play that was labor was like a thing you do from this time to this time for money. And then you go and you play and you have fun. Work is where you're there all the time because you love it and you like forget your wife's birthday. Like there's a difference, difference <laughs> between the two. So they do the distinction like work, labor and play. I think it was Auden, W.H. Auden. Yeah. Hmm. I do remember seeing that. I'm not intimately familiar with it, but I, I remember that hitting my radar. Well, they had like this de this demarcation that was like, work is done, time for fun now. And I just think it's definitely, people kind of demand more now, like especially the younger people that are joining the workforce are like, mm, this is my whole, my whole life, my life as a whole needs to be pleasurable, you know, at some point, not like all day, every day, but every day needs to have some fun element to it. Do you think that that's realistic? I do. Um, but what I would say is that also honoring that it's an act of mindfulness, it's meant to be um, femoral, right? Because you're supposed to enjoy it in the moment and then know it, it's going to go away and then know that it's going to come back. And so once you 
understand that it's there when you want it because you do have agency and autonomy, a little bit more control over your domain than you gave yourself credit, then you can start working within that paradigm and everything seems to get fixed. And so the good news for this work is even though it's a hard sell for all the you know questions that you guys have brought up, it becomes an easy sale sell once people start to integrate it, right? Because we're not talking about drastic changes. We're talking about figuring out what are a few ways to integrate things in. So you're like, you know what, my, my life's worth living. And so one other thing I would bring up, especially in the context of your audience is that, you know, similar to sleep where we were looking at sleep deficits and then seeing, you know, the, the, the quantification of productivity and, and how it would just kind of fall off a cliff. We're now seeing that with leisure too. So the folks that are able to engage. Undeficit. This work, yeah, yeah, exactly. Undeficit. Oh That's right. God. No, and it's, you know, you could call it leisure deficit, fun deficit. Um, but if you're not enjoying yourself in the sweet spot, this comes from Dr. Cassie Holmes, who's actually looked at it from a quantified slant. Um, you know, if there isn't two to five hours within your day, um, then so under two hours, it starts to become problematic. To answer an earlier question, if you're like really whimsically living your life more than five hours a day, then you can start to be like, uh, you know, you can start to lose sort of the purpose and meaning and, you know, to Viktor Frankl's work, then things can start to go a little bit off the rails as well. But so the Goldilocks spot seems to be two to five hours. And when you look at uh, time survey data, um, again, I will just acknowledge that the most time poor individuals are working mothers and domestic partnerships. Um, those folks still, um, you know, when you look critically at their schedule, tend to still be able to find two hours out of their 24 that they can manipulate in a way, you know, that where they can regain and say, these two hours, I'm going to be very explicit of how I want to spend them. And that might still be with their partner or their kids, but they can control exactly what they do within at least two out of their 24 hours. I'm going to poke into some of the comments now. I have one from Steve who said, and then thank goodness he cl cleared this up because I didn't know what the, mm -hmm. the hell he was talking about. Rebecca's speech to her kids was impactful. You will not make your life smaller because of me. This thing that happening is happening to me will not be the thing that holds you back. This was from evidently this is. Oh, uh, yeah. So, um, yes. Um, Michael said a low state of, uh, sorry, a lot of low arousal activities are still fun. Like reading a book or. Oh, okay. I'm glad you clarified because I didn't know. What I don't know. I think okay. that's what they were saying. No, yeah, it's probably good. I mean, Michael said, you get aroused easily or something. I'm very, Everything's I get aroused. arousing. Blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo. What would your recommendation be to shift from the hustle culture uh, to the pursuit of joy and wonder? I don't yeah, like so, hustle culture to begin with. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's as insidious as, you know, some people refer it as hustle porn, right? I mean, you can, I, I, I fall victim to it because I think, you know, it, to some degree, it's sort of, of interesting, right? There's an ideal there um, that episodically does make sense. But, you know, you start all these algorithms feed us information and we know what happens. I mean, it just primes the brain, right? And various people are going to be susceptible to it. Um, you know, and some people it won't, they'll be able to completely just, you know, sort of let it pass by and other people are affected. Um, to answer the question, the folks that I saw, and I'm talking about, you, you know, across the board from very high level executives, you know, one of my friends who said I can use his name, Brad Wills was the chief strategy officer, helped Mind Body Online become public, um, you know, and a whole host of others. The ones that were able to achieve that were very deliberate about their schedule. So there's always this weird paradox, right? Like if you're saying that serendipity and novelty are one of, um, you know, the most interesting ways to invite things like wonder into your life. And you're telling me to schedule everything, you know, how does that even coexist? Well, creating those opportunities so that you can have spontaneity is the best way to make it happen. And so again, going back to, you know, even if it's just three or four hours a week, if those three or four hours where you're being deliberate about your time gets you into nature, you're, you're inviting in that serendipity of like, oh, wow, you know, you see something amazing in nature that sort of connects you to something bigger than yourself. Or, you know, it's a spiritual practice that, you know, where you're being deliberate about the time you have for that, but those insights that you get, you know, a la Sam Harris or whatever, you know, whoever you prescribe to, to get you there, those moments won't happen if you don't make the time for them. And so even folks that have extremely busy schedules, 
you know, 60, 70 hours a week, you, you minus, you know, that from 168, which is how many hours we have in a week. And there's still a lot of time left on the table. So again, you know, I think if you're just mindful of it, it's not a hard exercise. It just requires a little premeditation. And oftentimes that premeditation creates so much friction because we're like, really, I need to, yeah, exactly. I need to take an hour of a not fun thing to start having it. And again, yeah, that is true. But once you get the flywheel going and you realize in two or three weeks that it's invigorating, you know, where before the activities you were doing are depleting, it becomes a really easy sell. So I had a question about the uh, book itself. What what are the, uh, I, I'm just panicking because I think I left, yeah, I did. I was going to say, I thought I left the book in a really stupid place on the other screen. What are, um, what are some examples of, and it's funny because you, you watched the Johnny Cupcakes episode. He had to do just a little bit of tweaking to his brand fairly recently because he was getting so many angry people who kept thinking it was a cupcake shop that he had to like triple down on the fact that he sells t-shirts. He did make a really funny t-shirt with an angry review printed right on it about right. this lady that's like, they don't have any food. I was hungry. So is that, so that is but my Chris, sort of my first today. introduction to you was, uh, I think you said it at WDS. I wrote it down because again, I was doing my due diligence again, been a fan oh. for a long time that says I, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially said, don't pay attention to your positive or negative reviews. I think that was the first piece of Chris wisdom I've gotten. So huh. I'll let you continue, it, but I I've been, I've yeah. taken that to heart because the reviews are really funny. So like, well, that's one what I wanted to like, know. I wanted to know like, yeah, yeah. who's misunderstood your book? Who's, who's like, oh, so this isn't, I was expecting a bunch of activities. <laughs> this book should be fun. No, I that's expect right. it to I come think... with pipe cleaners and action figures. Yeah, the true whimsical folks, and rightfully so. Like I have no, there's been nothing that's been really mean. You know, one call, person called me a dork. I am the biggest dork, so I found that endearing. Um, yeah. The one I really found comical was, one person was like, I'm really annoyed about how much this guy loves his kids. Um, and, but then the next one was like, I don't like this guy because in the book I talk about uh, a non-fun activity for me is, uh, wow, yeah. I'm on a roller coaster. Don't um, even mind me. Here, <laughs> it'll be just you. Um, in the book, I talk about uh, my wife and I swapping out, giving our kids baths because it, it wasn't a fun activity with them um, to go have dates. And how we did it, again, kind of to Kelly's point in a way that didn't cost a lot of money because, you know, hiring a babysitter can put a lot of, uh, uh, of weight on making, you know, date nights uh, special. And, uh, and so the next review was, I don't like this guy because he doesn't like his kids. So you can't please everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I like my kids. I don't like anybody else's necessarily. It's not guaranteed. <laughs> not a guarantee. We're just going to do the rest of the show like this. Yeah, <laughs> we're like, right. we're like yeah. in the sun. Well, that's okay. We're at the end of the show anyway. What a good, <laughs> what a good gang we've had today. Listen, we're at a point where we have to do a couple of things anyway, so we have to. Let's see, that sounds good. Oh, and here's our person of the day. Kaboom! It has been a really fun be... day. Who do you think? I think Steve Garfield from SteveGarfield.com, the his, first video blogger. First video blogger. His mom is uh, one of the oldest video bloggers. I mean, bloggers. Sorry, she had. Millie's blog. So there's been a lot of one of the most lot seasoned. Of firsts seasoned. She's old. Shut up. So anyway, She's beautiful. She is beautiful. Anyway, that's our person today. Steve, that entitles you to one free apple. You just have to go to store, buy the apple, clean it off, eat it, bake it into like hey, a Steve. I, I will buy you a book. That was a great question. Oh, he already bought it to me. Oh, he Steve, did. Steve he already bought it already. It. Steve bought it uh, early on in the, in the uh, process. He said, uh, "Let's see, where am I? I'll go back. I'll go back." Kaching bought the book, so he's already a purchased wow. purchased person. So Steve uh, wins. Maybe you, Steve. maybe a T-shirt or a sticker or something. Yeah, something yeah. a sticker. <laughs> sort of a fun sticker. Yeah, something uh, fun. All right. So here's our question from Mike. us in the in heaven. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's a backpack question. What goes in your backpack? This could be something physical. It could be something metaphorical. Carrie, what's a physical thing you could add to a backpack? Maybe shades. Extra set of teeth. Oh, hmm. you never know. You said that before. Is there anything? In my 20s, I used to carry an extra yeah, doorknob. She, she repeats the same one every time now. It's a thing. Um, uh, what's gotcha. something metaphorical you could add? Kindness. Kindness. Mm -hmm. Who said that? Ariel Helvetica, burlesque performer. 
And how yeah. was your response to that? Was it fun? <laughs> was it a fun response? When I you, laughed was... in her face, but it, not because of what she said. It's you're taking it out of context. I think I am. And I was not the only person laughing. Dr. Mike Rucker, what would you add to your backpack? Yeah, so I was primed for this. And uh, I think a, a dog bowl, because we really need a dog in this. And again, it's adjacent research, but how much um, pets can add fun to your life. And our dog passed away a, a few years ago, and we had oh, been reluctant to get another one. I think if I put a dog bowl in my backpack, that would be a good sort of cue to, to, to get a new companion. Do you have a dog bowl in your backpack? I have one in my closet. But um, the I collapsible three eye kind, those are pretty convenient. Uh, no, you know, it's like steel, stainless steel. Very, nice. um, but would you put fashion. that in your backpack? <laughs> like um, high end, I, you know, I don't know if I'd put it in my backpack. That's a great question. I, I think dogs are much more uh, uh, smart than that. They can go find water on the, on the road, and I have two hands, so you want like yeah, a baby Bjorn for the dog, baby Pew. like a puppy Bjorn, like those people who do that thing, oh. yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it's related to that. Um, my grandmother was known for pointing, and uh, there's many, many pictures of her pointing. There's actually several times where, um, uh, what do you call those? Help me, seagulls would uh, poop on her hand uh, as she pointed out oh more than once. <laughs> oh my so, God. Isn't that good luck? I, yeah, that's what they say. That's what she would tell us. I thought it was gross. But, I think they um, just tell you that to make you feel better about getting pooped on. I can also tell you about dogs that she had kind of an iffy relationship with dogs, but they loved her. And the one time that she finally got over that, it was because. Uh... Backpack show. Oh, I just started, <laughs> started the 